Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Did you get some rest? Good, good. Uh, let me start by just uh, saying that any information you need is available to you. There is also a message board if you have uh, messages from home. And uh, the ushers will instruct you as to where those are. The other thing I'd like to know is how many of you are here for the first time at a conference? Hold your hand up high. Stand up. Let me see you. Well, welcome. God bless you. And how many revival junkies that keep coming back to conferences do we have? Hold your hand. There you go. How many of you were at last year's worship conference? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, let me get a couple of announcements out of the way. We're, going, we're sharing our musicians this week with the pastor across the way because he's a big baby and he has to have music when he preaches. So, And uh, because we are musicians and we serve our pastor, I said we serve our pastor, what he wants he gets. Yes, sir. How would you like it? Somebody said, I don't believe in that kind of leadership. Well, get out of church because that's how it is. What if the pastor's corrupt? Let God deal with him. Ain't my job. <laughs> my pastor is a wonderful man. He is not corrupt, so I just serve him anything he wants. Um, a couple of things uh, I want to say to you is um, if any of you happen to be in Texas in October. That's a sad place to be in October. No, it's not, Texas. See, I knew I'd get a rise out of you. No, Wichita Falls, Texas, we will be having. Are you from Wichita Falls? Oh, awesome. We're gonna be having a worship encounter. And let me see if I can get the dates. I got my computer here just so I can. I don't know if anybody else is like me, but if I go anywhere without this computer, I'm dead. Just a second, it's, it's booting up. Uh, here we go. I can give you exact dates, that way I don't have to guess. October 21, 22. Uh, if you want more information, you can call uh, my office at 850-479-9981. And if you want that information, if you got the CDs, there's information. You can inquire the website, uh, www www.mmi, two M's and an I, dash inc dot com. And we'll tell you, what we're doing is uh, we're doing some worship encounters throughout the nation, and uh, they are not conferences. And I want to make sure everybody understands, they are not conferences. They are not about conferring. They are not about sitting and being taught for three days. They are about radical worshipers who want to get together and see how quickly we can see God build the tabernacle of David again in the last days. It's pretty much out and out worship. We will teach some, but it's going to be, it's, what we're trying to do in meetings is to move away from a format because sometimes, you know, when you're headed down a particular road, it takes a strong turn left or right when you turn, it, if, you're, if you're going to put on your right-hand signal and you're taking a right, when you turn, everybody shifts, right? It gets a little uncomfortable, especially if it's a real hard turn because you go up on one leg, you know, and you're like, what did you do? My wife, man, I, she, she says I drive like I'm drunk all the time. And uh, I think wives have that anointing. They have that anointing to tell you how bad you drive. And so, good Lord, Lyndall. Can't you drive any better than that? Like, well, honey, I'm doing the best. Well, my heavens, I mean, everything in my purse just went over on the other side of the car. What are you doing? Anytime it's time to make a turn, you'll, you'll dislodge everything sometimes, and you make a turn. But if everybody will hold steady and hang on, we can collect all of our belongings and get back to going. So what we really believe is that God is wanting to come back to his church in a powerful, powerful way. And we believe the word of God that says, Jesus said greater things you'll do than I did. We also believe the book of Acts and we believe it's open-ended. 
we don't believe that the miracles and the signs and the wonders and the glory stopped. Uh, but we've been looking around the American church and wondering where they went. And so what we're saying is, instead of sitting here in belly aching going, well, God, where are you? Why won't you do something? Well, what if we just make a format that's open-ended where he can do whatever he wants to do? But at the same time, if he chooses to do nothing but let us worship him, then that's what we're going to do. So that's what we're doing at Worship Encounters. So uh, we'll be letting you know if you'll get on the website I just gave you of future Worship Encounters. We're hoping to do uh, several of them around the state so we can get wherever people are. Will that help you out maybe? Um, this morning, I'm just going to start right out the shoot here teaching if it's okay. I feel like I have something from the Lord this morning. And I believe it's going to either bless you or make you mad. Sometimes both have to happen. Most of the time God has ever changed my life majorly, he usually made me mad. Anybody else here? Somebody said, I didn't come to church to get mad. Well, I'm not going to try to purposely offend you because I'm a good guy. I like to laugh. But I'm starting to see some things in the Word of God. Turn to 1 Samuel with me, the ninth chapter. This is, to me, and probably to most musicians and worship leaders and artsy type folks and intercessors, it's probably a very familiar passage. But I want to talk about it just for a moment. Another couple things. How many worship leaders do I have here? Awesome. How many pastors? I got some worship pastors. Okay, how many uh, intercessors do I have here? Oh, they always outweigh the musicians. Hallelujah. That's good. Always more of you. Well, Lila's going to be speaking right after me. And what we're hoping to do this week is to, is to make you understand how worship and intercession work together. I think last night you saw some of that. God is doing more of that. And we don't by any means have all the answers or know how to do it. There are people around the nation who are probably doing it better and probably well. They're, they have way surpassed what we're even into here. But we're making meager steps toward it. It does not mean we have left the revival of repentance because any intercessor and any worshiper will tell you that the more of God you get, the more repenting you have to do. Repentance is not something you do one time when you get saved. Repentance is something that's perpetual in your life. And a lot of people don't understand that. They say, well, do I, I don't, Paul said that I don't need to go back and rebuild the foundation of repentance from dead works over and over and over. Well, that is probably what a lot of full gospel slash Pentecostal people have done for centuries. Uh, not centuries, we haven't been around that long. But, but for decades, uh, coming to church, how many of you are from a, full gospel Pentecostal background? How many of you are from a charismatic background? How many of you are from uh, what we'll call liturgical? Presbyterian, uh, Catholic, pres uh, Episcopal, Methodist? All right, now Baptist. There's more of them than there are of God, of children of God. I'm telling you, the Baptists are everywhere in the South. Those of us who came up in Pentecost, those of you who didn't come up, you'll have to understand, and pardon me, because I'll make some inferences to make you understand, because that's where I came from. We did a lot of repenting, but ours was always getting saved over and over again. Because we weren't ever sure we were saved. Because we had a real problem with grace. We didn't understand grace. Grace was a difficult thing to understand for us. And we thought all the people across the fence who had greasy grace... We called it greasy grace because isn't it amazing how that when the church gets divided in the spirit that it's always the majors, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the outer fringe that we focus on, not the things we agree on. It's the outer fringe. It's like Baptist, Methodist type folks preach against tongues because they think all that Pentecostals do is speak in tongues. And I'll admit, I've been around a few of those. And I, you know what I'm saying? But then the Pentecostals think that all the Baptists believe you can drink, lie, cheat, steal, fornicate, and if you ever accepted Jesus, you're still saved. Well, Baptists really don't believe that. They really don't believe that fully. 
but we're focusing on the outer fringe of their doctrine. Do you see what I'm saying? Eternal security. We fuss on that one all the time, overlooking many, many great doctrines that they've brought to the body of Christ. Do you understand? Focusing on the periphery, on that outer edge will always get you in trouble, and it brings division within the Pentecostals. And when I say Pentecostals, I'm not talking about the United Pentecost. I'm talking about what we would call people who speak in tongues and believe in the gift of the Spirit. You may be charismatic. Uh, you know, the difference there is, you know, I mean, come on. There's black and then there's black. You know what I mean? There's gray black, there's blue black, but they're all black. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you're Pentecostal, you're all Pentecostal, whether you're charismatic variety or you're the old war horse Pentecostals with the bun on your head. Do you, you still believe, you still believe in the Holy Spirit, you believe in speaking in tongues, you believe in the power of God, whether you're United Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostal Church of God, Pentecostal Holiness, all that. Do you understand? Word of faith, whatever. Same, all these things are, are we all come from kind of the same place. But we focus on the peripheral outside edges of the differences that we have. And those things divide us further, even within Pentecostal lines. Because there are parts of Pentecost that we don't accept because of their outside doctrines. Does that mean those doctrines are okay? No, it doesn't. Does it mean I believe in eternal security the way some people teach it? No, it doesn't. Does it believe that I agree with everything about everybody and we just homogenize it and go, hey, we're all just one, whatever it takes? No, it doesn't by any means. There are doctrinal differences. There are some errors in different veins of doctrine. Does that make them not brothers in Christ? Well, that depends. Do they still believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Do they still believe that only the blood of Jesus will save you and not works? By, lest any man should vote, boast. Do they believe in the imminent return of Christ, whether it's before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or after the tribulation? Bottom line, do they believe he's coming again? If they do, then there are brothers. Do you see what I'm saying? Did I get all that said, all right, to not offend you? I'm already losing people. I already got people mad at me. I hadn't even got to the part that's supposed to make you mad, and I've already got people mad. I'm trying to set up a foundation. But God has been in the need of making a vast turn, and we've all sensed the Lord turning things in our churches and in our nation. And it's frustrated some of us. And, and there's been a separation of intercessors and worshipers. We've not understood this, the, 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 the gift of intercession, the office of intercession. We've not understood what worship was for that fact. We thought worship was contained to the Sunday morning. I was looking at a pamphlet the other day of a, of a major church, a mainline denominational church, and it said, come join us for morning worship. And I didn't do it in a cynical way, just in a suspicious way. And I wondered how much worship was going to happen in that morning worship service. It almost feels like we need to be like the Church of Christ and call them morning meetings. Come to the morning meeting. Because when we say worship, that means we're going to give God worthy ship in that building. And that most everything that happens, I understand we have to say hello, shake hands, and all that sort of thing. We have to be courteous to one another. But there should be a large hunk of a worship service that is worship, wouldn't you think? Whether it's the offering or the music or the preaching or whatever, it should be directing the attention to the Lord and not to us. Would you believe that? I would believe that. But I'm, I'm convinced that we have a misunderstanding and God is trying to bring correction to us. And he's trying to make us understand what, what really worship is and what intercession is and, and all these different parts of the body of Christ, how they're working and what their purpose is, instead of keeping us all constantly fussing with one another. But the bottom line is a turn is coming. We sense it. We can almost feel the curve starting to lean. We know something's happened. Some of us like it and some of us don't. There are churches who are not comfortable with what God is trying to do. And I totally understand that because it's very disquieting when God starts moving. And people are unpredictable. I've seen people do things in this building that I wish they hadn't. 
<laughs> I've been seen some people do some things that were embarrassing to me, especially when I invited visitors. Somehow when we invite people to our meetings, we want everything to go kind of smooth because we want people to be comfortable in the meeting and want to come back. But the thing we must understand, if you want a comfortable place, there is a bunch of those out there. But I think what people are groaning for in their spirit is to be discomforted by something that's unsettling and unexplainable. And the danger there is when we humans try to make the unexplainable happen by weirdness. The worst thing in the world is a, pro a, a prophetic utterance that isn't of the Spirit. And the Bible had a way to deal with that. You killed the guy. And I think we should probably reenact that. I really think that if we would just make stones available in the lobby and if a guy prophesied and it didn't come to pass, we just hang him up there and stone him. I guarantee you, Lila, when people opened up their mouth to prophesy, it would be on target from then on. They go, yes, thus saith the Lord. And you go, you're right. It's going to be the Lord of your life. He better come through for you. You're in trouble. But it's those kind of fringe things that cause people to get all weirded out. And it's the reason we have to pastor revival, the reason we have to pastor worship, the reason we have to pastor intercession is because where's the line? You know, you're walking the line. You're like, one line is you're on the stage, the other one's you're off on your face. Because God will do some unexplainable things and you have to discern of the Spirit what it is. And sometimes the things God will do, or not God will do, but the reaction that people have to what God has done will be unpredictable. And maybe not even the Bible, in the Bible. Uh oh, <laughs> hit a bump there, didn't I? I didn't say God would do things that were contrary to his word. I said we react to God in ways that weren't necessarily recorded in the Bible. Because how, who had time in the amount of Bible we've got to explain everybody's reaction. There is not hardly a play-by-play -play on the day of Pentecost. There is an overview. It's an overview. But there's a lot of holes that are left to make us wonder. Well, what happened? Well, there was a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. But the holes are, how loud was it? And who all heard it? Well, I know that at least 3,000 heard it. 5,000 heard it. People from every nation that were in, in every tongue and tribe who were in Jerusalem for Passover heard it because they were hearing their own languages being spoken. What was that like? I mean, think about that. See, you don't think about the supernatural and the holes, the stuff they didn't explain in the Word. Have you ever thought about that, Lila? Have you ever thought about, here we are in Brownsville. What would it take in Pensacola or this half of Pensacola? What kind of sound would have to happen that would literally cause all of downtown to shut down and come out and see what was going on? What would it, it would have to be something that sounded like an earthquake or something that was so loud that people came out to, you know, you hear a gunshot, you stick your head out the window to see who got it, you know, or who's shooting. When you hear a sound of a rushing mighty wind, where did they come from? They came from everywhere to see because that's when they saw these people who were acting suspiciously. They were acting like drunkards. So it made them, something happened. So... There's not full explanation in the Bible of everything that happened. There isn't time. But when God comes sometimes, we've seen it happen here. People have reacted in ways that I just went, man, why do you have to do that? You know, Kent, I've, I've found myself on my back in the floor wishing that God could have touched me another way. I loved the touch, but, I, you know, I didn't want to wrinkle my suit. You know, I, I want... You know, and, I, and, and occasionally in the presence of the Lord, when a word of the Lord comes and I really feel God, I'll, I'll, my shoulder will 
kind of do this, and I, I wish I didn't do that, because I, it's okay with me now, but in the beginning, I thought, what do people think that I have Tourette's or something's wrong with me? I got a problem. It's, and it kind of worries you about yourself because you really don't s sense what God's doing, but just something, do I, am I going to base a doctrine on my shoulder twitching? No, but it's part of the turn. It's part of the turn that God's doing. Do I believe in manifestations? I don't even go there. We've talked about that for seven years. I'm tired. It's an old subject. I I'm done with that. I'm ready to move on with whatever it is the Lord wants to do. And if I get a manifestation, hallelujah. If I don't, well, hallelujah. I want the Lord. I want the Lord of the manifestations. That's what I want. Now, here's what I want to talk about. I'm, in the, I'm, 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 I'm smack dab in the middle, as I've been for two years, of writing a book. And... I did my part and I sent it all in to my editor and my editor had some, some scheduling problems and, and he's had it since February or March, all of my material. And we were supposed to be finished April 1, but we're not. But as I, I'm on my sixth, fifth chapter right now, final edits, final putting it together. And as I was writing, I. I said something in my book, and sometimes when I say things, I feel the sense of prophecy coming on me, and I don't like it because it scares me. Because I'll say stuff and go, wait a minute, should I have said that? And you just kind of blurt it out. The difference in doing it in a meeting is it goes by, and some people catch it, some people don't. But when it's in black and white, they'll come back to your doorstep someday and go, well, you wrote this. This is not right. So you try to go back and pour over it and make sure it's doctrinal. You know, that it's not just some wild thing that you're coming up with. As I was writing, I was talking about this turn. I've been writing about this turn that God is doing in the earth today. And it's a disquieting turn. turn. And even though I came up Pentecostal, as you know, and I'm comfortable with certain things the Lord wants to do. And I grew up with, some, with stuff in church that, that, like I said, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians of today, now not the old Methodist, not the John Wesley Methodist. They would be comfortable with it, but the new Methodist wouldn't be comfortable with it because they're not even comfortable, a lot of them, with this. And, you know, John Wesley would have blown their mind, you know. They don't even understand what those circuit-rided preachers are that are painted on the side of their buildings in Nashville, Tennessee. They don't even understand who that is. They think it's just a guy who rode on horseback and preached. But, but those were wild boys back then, let me tell you. It was frontier world, and they were like frontier leaders in the, in the kingdom. So I've been used to people dancing in church all, all my life. I've been comfortable with people jerking, quivering, and all that, speaking in tongues. I mean, we did a lot of stuff in church. Some of it was God, some of it was flesh, but, but I, I'm comfortable with that. But God has been trying to make a change in the kingdom that's, that's even myself. I'm not, I'm comfortable with anything God wants to do. Let me say that again. I'm not always comfortable with what God wants to do. I'm confident in what he wants to do, that it's okay. But I don't understand where we are right now. It feels like we're between two worlds. It feels like the door has closed on something, but the door has not yet opened on what's coming next. People have called it a level. People have called it whatever. I, I don't want to call it that because my core message is love God, serve Him, and worship Him if He never does another thing. That's when I'm out there, Lila, blasting people and just trying to get in their head and indoctrinate them, if you will, to get them out of the mode of coming to church to get something, but rather come to church to give something and forget about the blessings, forget about your needs and come into his sanctuary and offer him something and say, Lord, I want you, not your stuff. I'd rather have you than your stuff. That's another sermon. I'll talk about that next week. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But it feels like something's about to come to us in the kingdom of God that hasn't come yet. 
And and when we when I say that, certain people who are on the the the, the more fanatical side go, ooh. I can't wait. And they see explosions and, and fireworks and just radical wildness. But then the more conservative of us in this building, we go, well, I wonder what that could be. And then there are those so conservative that they choose to ignore it and just go, well, I'm just going to be who I am in the Lord and I'm going to practice the four laws and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. But see, scripturally, that isn't in keeping with what the Word of God says, because the Bible is full of stories of pursuit of the Lord, going after what He has, instead of just saying, well, it'll come to me if God wants me to have it. And it's also in contrast to a loving relationship with a lover of our soul. Because to say that whatever God has for me will just come to me because I'm in His kingdom is to say this, when Amber and I were courting and we were about to marry, when I first saw her on the parking lot out here and fell in love with her, that means that, well, if we're supposed to be married, one day she'll just come by and ask me and, and, and it'll happen. We'll just find ourselves mysteriously in front of the preacher and she'll accidentally have on a white dress and I'll accidentally have on a tux and believe it or not, there will be, there will be bridesmaids and groomsmen just supernaturally just just translated and he'll just be there on the stage and the preacher will be there and the day will be there and all the family will be there and it and and and, and a cake will just d appear out of nowhere because it's supposed to happen because if you got a wedding you got a reception and you know that'll just all happen no sir all of you married men when you saw something you wanted you pursued it god was teaching you a spiritual law in the physical God was teaching you as a man how to pursue him the way you pursued your wife. Ladies, the Lord is trying to teach you how to please the Lord by pleasing your husband. By serving him, you serve the Lord. Men, by loving your wife and protecting her and serving her, you serve the Lord. But it doesn't happen by accident. Good marriages don't just happen. You got to work at them. And the problem with marriage is the person you're married to is a person. That's the hardest part. When I married my wife, and she still is a gorgeous little redhead, and she's got a beautiful body and a beautiful face, and everything's wonderful, and it would have been great if we had just stayed there. But turns out she had an opinion. And her opinion got more opinionated the longer we've been married. It started off quiet and mousy, and I thought, well, I have got me a submitted bride. She's just going to be what I want her to be. Till all of a sudden, her red hair kicked in. And with it came her mouth. And she suddenly had an opinion about everything. Now, in order to live with her, and in order for she to live with me, because I have an opinion, I've always had an opinion and a mouth. Two of us, it's difficult for two opinions and two mouths to live in the same house. Unless you're pursuing your marriage. Just because you got married doesn't mean that happiness is just going to come by and happen. You make it happen. Well, why do you think you've learned those things in the natural? Because they work in the supernatural too. That's why we come to church and we get prayer. That's why we read our Bible. That's why we're talking about being between two worlds. Because we believe that there's more of God than we have. There's more of Him than we know. So it keeps us on the pursuit of God. I'll let you in on a little secret. Not meant to discourage you, but encourage you. You're never going to get Him until you're dead. Let that just sink in real good. Now, what I'm saying is you're going to get God, absolutely, salvation, the Holy Spirit, and all that kind of stuff. But what we as worshipers and intercessors are really pursuing is a physical touch and a physical glimpse of God. And you ain't going to get it till you're dead because you can't handle it. Till he comes back 
if he comes back before we all die, you might bypass it and just move right into glory and be able to see him. But if he doesn't come over the next 50 years, many of us in this room will be dead, but you will finally see him. You see, it's not getting the goody, it's pursuing the goody where the joy is. Pursuing God is not a sad thing, it's a joyful thing. Pursuing God is not meant to make you angry. And so, you know, this desperation of seek, seeking the Lord is a sublime desperation. It's an anticipative de desperation that makes you want, the more you get, the more you want. Oh, but Lindell, I'm just miserable. You're miserable because you have sin in your life and you won't let go of it to really pursue him the way you want to. Because you're not really in the race yet. You're just thinking about it. That's why you're miserable. But once you discard everything that's keeping you out of the race and get rid of every weight and sin, as the scripture says, it's hard. It's a miserable day. I like to run when I'm running. It's when I'm thinking about it, I hate it. Anybody who's ever jogged or ran in your life, you understand the biggest battle is putting your shorts and your shoes on. And the first 10 minutes. Once you pass the first 10 minutes, you got it whipped and you start feeling good. And when you're finished, you're going, oh, I'm so glad I did that. It's the same with pursuing the Lord. The people who are miserable pursuing the Lord are the people who've got, think about this, add, add insult to injury. You got to put your shorts on, you got to put your shoes on, and then you got to pick up two 50-pound dumbbells and run. I mean, that's just hell on earth to me. It's bad enough to carry my luggy old body on, on my feet. Let me add 100 pounds to it and start carrying it and running. That's why the scripture says, lay aside every sin and every weight that does so easily beset you. In other words, it makes you sit down. It's a besetting sin. In other words, you're sitting down instead of running the race. You're besetting. You're bisetting. You're watching. You're miserable today because you're not running the race. You're just thinking about running the race. And the more you think about what the race could bring you and the joy it could bring you, the more miserable you are sitting on your hiney. You're upset with yourself because you should be in the race. Do you see what I mean? But those that are in the race and are desperately pursuing the Lord are not full of anger and a bad desperation. It's a good desperation. It's like, I'm desperate. It was like that good desperation when I would call Amber and say, Amber, would you go to the beach with me? I just want to walk and hold your hand. Now, I was desperate to see her again, but there was this overwhelming joy of when I saw her. That's what, that's what we're talking about in the pursuit of God. It's not that kind that makes you... God does not give you desperation to make you pitiful he gives you a little glimpse of himself to fill you with joy for the next time you see him that's why we pursue the lord that's why we worship the lord because we're thinking that through our worship and our intercession we might catch another glimpse of him and it's like yes it's hard and yes i have trials and yes things are tough but the thought of seeing him one more time causes me to go well oh, let me put my shoes on and my shorts i'm going I have to visualize when I run the race because my belly jiggles. And in my mind, I see this spelt body, this torso that, like they have on TV, where it doesn't jiggle when you run. That's what makes me get out of bed. I see in my head this tight ab section, and I'm not jiggling anymore. And it makes me jiggle more and run. Because I see something I'm wanting. That's what makes me pursue the Lord. I don't see where I am. I see where I will be when I get in touch with him one more time. I see that I'm here, but if I can get in touch with the Lord one more time, I'll be here. And whatever trial I have today will dissipate with one more, one more glimpse of the Lord. See, this has nothing to do with heaven or hell salvation, what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about the constant pursuit of the Lord that brings joy to your life and makes you hilariously happy. So this week, if you're miserable, why don't you lay aside those dumbbells you're running with? This week, just lay them down and get in the race. You'll get out of breath and your side will hurt a couple of times and God will have to do a little surgery on you here and there. But it's good surgery. You feel light and better after you're finished. Now, I had nothing to do with what I was going to say out of 1 Samuel. But I got a lot of time. I got another hour so I can just really go anywhere I want. So y'all just hunger, hunker in. We're bunkering down right here, okay? So I said, we're going to worship some of these mornings a lot. But I got the floor first, and this is my conference, and I'm going to say what I want to say. <laughs> How do you like that? I'm sorry. As I wrote my book, I started seeing something about this turn that we're in and what's going on with us. And I think I have some insights that will help you. We have been under a certain mode of operation in the church. Um, obviously, the church as we know it was birthed on the day of, excuse me, the day of Pentecost. And, and God has brought us this far. But we've seen dips, we've seen peaks, we've seen valleys, we've seen silent years, we've seen times when uh, we've seen times when the monks, when all you could find of the church on the earth was a bunch of monks locked away in a monastery copying the Bible. There wasn't much else happening. We've seen outpourings like Azusa Street. We've seen the Wales Revival. We've seen some awesome things that God has done. We've seen John Wesley and, and, and we've seen he and his brothers' revivals that were all over the nations. We've seen Jonathan Edwards. We've seen those great, great men that we talk about a lot that God was bringing certain things through. But we find ourselves in a precarious place right now because Pentecost in this nation, as we have known it, is basically tagged on the door of Azusa Street. That doesn't mean that's the only thing God was doing, but it was a major thing God was doing. And we're coming up on the 100th year anniversary of that. I mean, just we're right on the heels of the 100th year anniversary of that happening. And with that happening, we had major Pentecostal denominations that were birthed. In the 60s and 70s, we saw the charismatic renewal that brought an influx of people out of Methodism, brought them out of uh, Catholicism into the move of the Spirit. It was an incredible, credible thing. Uh, the 80s were kind of a dud because the church was kind of trying to figure out what, what, where are we now? Where are we now? I believe that for some time we've been operating under an anoint, under a mode of operation, not an anointing, but a mode of operation that God is about to lay down and totally change it. And I'll tell you how much he's going to change it. He's going to change it as much as there is difference in Saul and David. I picked up my Bible and I started reading 1 Samuel 9. And it was talking about, Sam, uh, talking about Saul. Up till now, Israel, the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah, had never had a king, ever. And many of you know the story very well. Never had a king. The Lord said, I want to be their king. The Lord said, I want to be the one who directs them. I want to be the one who, who is in their midst, making the laws, making the decisions. I will speak through my prophets, through my men. This is how I want to have this kingdom. And Israel began to look at the nations around them that had kings. And they realized that, this thing with God was a little trickier than just having a fleshly king. Because with God, you couldn't really walk into his presence unless you had everything in order. And you always had to go through somebody else because, you know, it was a very dangerous thing to walk before the Ark of the Covenant and get in the, get in the Holy of Holies because prob probably you would die. Very few people did not die except for the high priests who were totally cleansed and totally ready to walk in. And... And it's, it's just amazing 
the people started saying, you know, if we had a fleshly king, if we had a, a guy on a throne that we could actually have, you know, some leadership that we could see instead of this invis invisible God, you know, we wouldn't be so weird looking. Think about Israel in the sight of the other nations. Everybody's got a king, and Israel has a God that you can't see, but he gives them directions. <laughs> imagine what, imagine what you would think if you heard of a church where they didn't have any kind of a pastor. It's just God was there, and God spoke through people and said stuff. We all think they were out of their mind, and what happened to Israel is that's the way it was. They started going, you know, we need a king. We, we, we could really use a king. And in, by ask, in doing so, in asking for a king, what they're doing is rejecting. Anytime there's a major change, it means that we are embracing something new and rejecting something old or turning something old over. And going, whether we reject it fully or not, we realize it's antiquated and we're moving to some new mode of operation. So Israel decided they wanted a king. All right, this is a bad deal for Saul to start with. Think about it. You're going to be the king, and you're replacing God. Yeah. Bad way to build, bad foundation to start with. You're there because God, people didn't want God. How many pastors and ministers of music ever feel that way? You're there because God isn't. I'm convinced that most of our ministry in the church that we do is just a filler until God shows up. We kind of tell everybody that preaches here at Brownsville, Tommy, Tenney, and all those guys say, look, guys, y'all are here just in case God doesn't show. Have a sermon ready just in case. But if God shows, it's Katie bar the door, as they say in the South. It doesn't matter. Well, whatever happens, happens. That scares some people. Because they don't know about that God thing. But this is where Israel was. We want a king. We're going to get us a king. And Saul, you know, we think Saul is probably the guy. And, and read this with me. The ninth chapter of 1 Samuel. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish. Blah, 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 blah. Now let's go to two. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites. A head taller than any of the others. He was, the scripture says, an impressive young man, a head taller than the others. Go down to, uh, let me just, let me just kind of pour over this because I, I was looking at this this morning. The whole story that ensues here in the ninth chapter is about Saul looking for lost donkeys, and then the Lord anoints Sam, uh, Samuel. He, he goes to Samuel inquiring, and God chooses Saul as king. But I want to go to the 10th chapter, the 9th verse. After Samuel anointed Saul as king, here's what the scripture says. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day about the donkeys and the ladies prophesying and the, all that sort of thing that, that's in that earlier chapter. As a matter of fact, look here. When they arrived at Gibeah, at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he joined in their prophesying with all those who were formerly known and all those who had formerly known and saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? God changed Saul's heart, and suddenly, obviously, Lila Saul was not really a spiritual kind of fellow. But because he'd had an encounter with the Lord, there was a change of heart that happened. And suddenly a man who was not necessarily spiritual was found among the prophets prophesying. When the Lord came upon him, he prophesied. And the people who had known him all of his life went, whoa, he's prophesying. What's about that? What's that with Saul? 
Let's start from the beginning of this story and begin to, begin to, play, begin to play the church with Saul. Let's talk about that. Let's put those two together a minute, and let's parallel them just a minute. If you look around the nation right now at the church, from the outside looking in, it looks impressive. We've got multi-million dollar sanctuaries now. We used to have big churches. They were 500. Then we got bigger churches. They were 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. Then we got mega churches. They were 5,000. Now we got mega mighty morphin churches that are like 10,000, 15,000, huge churches, little cities within churches. I mean, it's like that's a whole city. I grew up in a town with 3,000 people. This church has, has more people in it in Brownsville than my whole town had in it. That's some big stuff. And looking from the outside in, you go, that's impressive. You drive, I drive by places, y'all, around the nation, and it looks like, it looks like a mall. I mean, some of these churches look like malls. If you've ever been in Memphis and you drive out there on 270 and you look over there and see Bellevue Baptist, I mean, that is one impressive looking thing. I mean, it's beautiful. And you think you need to go in there and buy some trousers or something because it's like a big mall. It's incredible. It's in impressive. Our preachers are great orators, and they know how to be relative to society. They dress impeccably. Our music is getting better and better. The drama has still got a, lot, a little ways to go, but it's getting better. If the church is big enough and they can afford it, they can actually send someone to Broadway to learn how to really do sets and how to really do costuming, and it's getting impressive. Christian television is getting a little less hokey these days. They're making movies now. It's getting impressive. It's getting to where Christ, and Christian music since the 70s has absolutely been for the amount of money they have to spend on par with secular music because it's like secular music record will cost about half a million to make. Most Christian records cost about fifty to 80000 to make. And with that little bit of money, they do a whole lot. They sound good. DC Talk, man, they sounded great in their day. They were like on par with what was going on. Kirk Franklin, he sounds as good as any of those guys out there. I mean, it's just impressive. Don't you think? I think Saul was impressive to look at. And let me say another thing about Saul. Saul was humble. When the church began in Western civilization, it began humbly. When Pentecost came to America, it came through a black man who had one eye. In a little building, their, their, prayer, their, their altars were made out of crates. It was humble. Many of you who grew up in Pentecost can remember we were always the other side of the track people because we believed in those tongues. And our women wore that hair. And we prided ourselves in separation of the way we looked. We didn't want to look like everybody else. We worked hard to not look like everybody else because we felt in a genuine sense that it was a way of keeping ourselves separated from what everybody else was into because we felt that we were a people after God and that we wanted to pursue God in every, every aspect of our lives. We began humbly. We began, the assemblies of God didn't begin with big, mighty, huge churches. The Church of God didn't begin having a general assembly with 20,000 people attending. It began under brush harbors in the south where you would actually stick up some sticks, a little frame, and lay leaves and trees over the top of it, and that would be the meeting place. The floors were dirt or sawdust if they were really uptown. People prayed. Men had prayer meetings when I was a boy. I can remember the last vestiges of this when I was a boy, seeing people have grove prayer meetings, we called them. They would go out into the woods, the men on one side and the women on the other side. 
And for an hour or two before service ever began, you could hear those woods full of people praying. There were no altars out there. There were no child care. People's shoes were dirty when they got to church. Their clothes were dirty because sometimes out in those prayer meetings, the Holy Spirit would move and people would roll in the floor. But there wasn't a floor. So it was dirt. They'd come to church and dust themselves off. They were farmers. They were simpletons. They were not wealthy. They were not people of standing or blue blood. But they were people who understood what the move of God was. And they had a hunger for it. And they would rather have Jesus than anything this world had to offer. They had their problems. But they also had God. And when that started to go away, then we started running on air. Because it took prayer and the power of the Holy Ghost to get us there. Then we figured if we build a nice building, put some carpet and air conditioning in it, it'll make people want to come rather than come to a brush harbor. Brush Arbor, they, instead of getting out into a brush harbor, they can come into a nice building and sit on a padded pew. And, and wouldn't that be great? So we got to looking better. We started getting educations. We started to understand the Word of God. We started sending our preachers to seminary, cemetery, sem, sem, teaching them the Bible. And in some cases, teaching them how not to believe in the mysterious workings of the Holy Ghost. We taught them how to speak properly, how to act properly, how to look impressive. We gave them PhDs. We gave them Armani suits. We gave them Lexus and Mercedes to drive. We gave them quarter of a million dollar houses. And it looked impressive. It's impressive. Our musicians used to only know one chord. You notice I didn't say one key, I said one chord. And it was a simple triad. And in most Pentecostal churches, it was G. Because that's the God key. G. And if somebody came in that knew how to really play, those of us who didn't know how to play, we'd just go to G and wait. Because we knew that sooner or later, if God was going to move, they'd have to go to G. It's all we knew. Now, our Pentecostal universities are turning out master's degree students. Lee College, which was a college for years for the Church of God, has now become a university. Impressive. We're starting to stand a head above the crowd. We look good. We're impressive. Let's go on. Where we have been in the church has been a result of God changing our heart. Because God had to take a heart in Saul that was not spiritual and turn it into a spiritual heart. We have been in a situation where there was no God before in our nation. There was, in our nations, when the Holy Spirit started breathing, the church was full of dead religious bones. And when the Holy Ghost started moving, he had to take old stony hearts and change them into pliable ones. You with me? That's what he had to do with Saul. There's another parallel. Uh, let's look down. 1017. Let's read that. Like I told you, Saul was the product of the, of the people's desire to look like the world system and be like it. Saul was put into power because of the people's rejection of God. And here's what it, here's what it was. Samuel summoned the people of Israel, of the Lord, at Mizpah, and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt. 
And I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you now, you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses. And you have said, no, set a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and it goes all the way down to what he, what he says. And out of the clan... Let me find it here. Going down here. The 22nd verse. Sorry, back up a little bit. When they brought forth the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Marjorie's clan was chosen. But when they looked for him, finally the son of Kish uh, was chosen. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Again, we're talking about the people's choice of rejecting the Lord and, high, and, and, and Saul is now king and he's hiding because he's humble. He doesn't want to take that position. Let's move forward to uh, the 12th chapter. Listen to what Samuel says in the 12th chapter. Let it sink in. I know you're a little tired because I didn't bring any music to make you happy. We'll do some music in the section, second section, okay? We loaned our musicians out, remember? Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. Now here's Samuel, the prophet, the voice, mouthpiece of the Holy Ghost. You hear me? Let this sit a type, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. Samuel is a type of the Holy Spirit. As for me, I'm old and gray and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand, testifying against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? For whose hand have I accept, from whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. And the people said, you have not cheated or oppressed us. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, The Lord is witness against you. And also his anointed is witnessed this day. That you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they say. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought forth your forefathers up from the, out, of the, out of Egypt. Now then... Stand here because I am going to comfort you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. After Jacob entered, he goes to the whole story. Here you hear Samuel saying, notice I, something has popped out of the scripture to me is why was he wanting to make sure that everybody's witness was good of him? He was saying this. I have been your leader. I have heard from God. I have told you what God wants to say to you. You have rejected God. Have I been honest? Have I said anything that would make you reject God? No, you haven't. Have I lied? Have I bribed? Have I cheated? Have I stealed? Have I been a bad person in a representation of the Holy Spirit to you? No, you haven't. Okay then, now I'm gonna tell you where God brought you from. This is Samuel's farewell speech. He's out of there. He's letting them know what God has done, and he said, I'm out of here. Now you got your king. Let's see what happens. See, Samuel knew what was going to happen. By the Spirit of the Lord, he knew disaster was in, on the way. Because the people, anytime you reject God, disaster's coming. Now let me, say you, let me give you the parallel of the church. Hope this don't make you mad. We have said, we'll take this, we'll take that, we'll take good music, 
We'll take good buildings. We'll take education. We don't need you, Holy Spirit, anymore. We can handle this. We've got our forms. We've got our plans. We've got our societies. We've got 12-step programs. We've got psychologists now. We don't need that Holy Ghost that was out there in the groves rolling in the dirt with the people. We don't need that old farmer Holy Ghost because now we are elite because we've taken one scripture out of context, and it's this one, to offer excellence before the Lord. Instead of an excellent spirit, we've offered excellent flesh. And called it excellence. We have said, oh, we got to offer excellence. So make the musicians practice. Make them learn the chords. But in the learning somewhere, they lost the Spirit of God. They learned how to play and they forgot how to pray. They learned how to perform, but they forgot how to perform acts on the altar of God and offer up incense that would be holy to a holy God. They learned how to do what they did, but they forgot what they knew. So much so that we've got doctrines floating around in mainstream organizations that maybe the Bible is not even the inspired word of God. Further, we have rejected the Lord. We've rejected the truth. We've rejected the move of his presence because it's uncomfortable to sinners. Well, excuse me. I thought that's what church was. I thought that there was supposed to be something in this house that would either make a sinner repent or leave. I thought that there was something in your face, on your job and at school and at work and in your home that would cause unsaved people to either be drawn to your compassion and your love and your kindness or made so uncomfortable because you're so loving and kind and you're portraying Jesus to them that they had to reject it because it made them showed up their darkness too much. See, I'm not talking about being offensive for offensive sake. Because we're to reflect the love of Jesus to people. The church is supposed to reflect the forgiveness and grace. But grace and forgiveness does not mean total acceptance. Acceptance means we accept anybody who comes in the door. But your sin is not acceptable. Homosexuals, we love you. But your sin isn't accepted. Liars, cheaters, stealers, fornicators, we love you. And we understand where you are. But... The holy God of heaven will not accept your sin. So there has to come a place where we get uncomfortable. I want God to use me, but there's things in my life God can't accept. And it's my choice to trade what I am for what God has or keep what I have and stay where I am. It's my choice. It's my decision. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm actually a guy full of grace, but I'm trying to explain to you in very harsh, strong terms where we have been in the American church. Not all of the American church. There are some great people out there, great churches. God has always had a church, but God is taking his church through a change. Okay? I'm almost done. As we read the story of Saul, let, let's, let's look at one more thing that I think is really incredible. Saul is rejected by the Lord. And... Uh, I actually did not mark my scripture, which I feel really dumb about that. So I will have to. Uh, I love this. Uh, in the, in the uh, 15th chapter, we've got Saul to the place where he's arguing with the prophet of God. Prophet of God said, you didn't obey the Lord. 20th verse, he says, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went to the mission that the Lord assigned me and completely destroyed the Am Amalekites. And brought back their king, Agag. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> when you start going toward the arm of the flesh and rejecting the power of the Spirit of the Lord, you start making excuses for yourself. And you start getting cunning and deceptive. And you don't even remember truth when it's spoken to you. Because your ears are covered. Uh, the scripture I'm looking for, and I had it... 
Now, how do you know that's the scripture I wanted? Oh, yeah. No, it's 30 I'm wanting. There you go. After Saul had disobeyed the Lord, misrepresented the Lord, and, and, it's, and had misinterpreted what the Lord had said. I mean, he knew he heard what the Lord said, but he didn't say it. Chapter 15, verse 30. Saul says this, I have sinned. He admits he sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. And you notice he didn't say the Lord my God, the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul and Samuel worshiped the Lord. And, uh, and Saul worshiped the Lord. So, Saul shows his arrogance and his disobedience. Another thing that's missing suspiciously in our churches today. And please understand, I'm not up here railing on the church. I love the church. This is my, my family. But it's time we just spoke truths. And this is the truth. Our altars are full of people repenting because they're trying to get out of hell. Because they feel bad that somebody found out what they were doing. But the scripture says that godly sorrow is what causes repentance to work. Saul didn't have a sorrow that comes from God. And I'm talking about a sorrow because he had broken the heart of God. That's what godly sorrow is. Is realizing, Lila, that what you have done has hurt the heart of the one you love. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like a man who's been unfaithful to his wife. And he's had an affair. And he says, honey, I know I have broken your heart. But will you still stay with me and walk and sit in church with me? And let's make everybody think we've got a good relationship. That's exactly what Saul was saying to Samuel. Samuel, come and worship with me so we can make this look good. We know it's a mess, but let's make it look good. Because the people, honor me, please, in front of the elders and the people. Honor me. We have never been in a time in our churches where we want more honor and more honor and more honor and more honor and more honor. We want to be honorable. We want people to honor our good traits. I'm almost done with the negative. I'm getting ready to get positive. Give me a minute. I believe that God is about to replace Saul's kingdom. Just as he did in the Bible. After Saul's dismal failure as the first king of Israel. I mean, he had a clean, Lila, he had a clean slate to work with. There had never been a king. He had every opportunity. He had had a changed heart. He had had a move of God. He had seen the miraculous. Hear me, y'all. Hear me by the Spirit of the Lord. Will you please? I know you're sleepy, but listen to me. He had had a miraculous happening in his life that had birthed him into being the king of Israel. A miraculous thing had happened. He had every opportunity to be the best king that Israel ever knew. He had a changed heart, a fresh kingdom. He could have turned the people to God. But he started becoming arrogant and believing his own press releases. He started believing that he had the answers. He started listening to the songs that the women were singing about how handsome he was. How, how, what a great arm, what a great and mighty warrior he was. It was delivering Israel in the, out, of the, out of the hands of every enemy they had. He would go down and just destroy and conquer. And, 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 and they honored him because of that. Oh, Saul, you're wonderful. Saul started believing it. And he started thinking that he could do this thing without God. I charge that the church has started to believe that we can make things happen in this nation without God. 
We may never say that, and we may not believe that in our core belief, but we act like it. Our actions are different than our words because we've decided to assimilate ourselves in such a way to make us comfortable and acceptable to what the world is going for. We look like the world. We sound like the world. We act like the world. We watch their movies. We listen to their music. We do everything they do. And I'm telling you, I came from legalism, and I know that, that believe me, some of that stuff I, was, I raised up on, some of those doctrines of women not fixing themselves up and being so ugly. I, I was ready for that to go. I really was. We had some ugly women in Pentecost. Let me tell you, I mean ugly. I mean, they couldn't do anything to fix up. It was just like, it was a sin. Go to hell for it. I know about all that silliness. And I know about railing people and going, there's no grace. You're going to hell. That beating people over the head with a billy club, that's gone. I don't believe, I believe in grace. But what I'm also saying is we are at a place where we have accepted this, this thing as normal that is not normal in the church. We have decided that it's okay to be acceptable. And I'm telling you that I believe before any of you musicians are going to play the sound of heaven, you're going to have to fast and pull yourself away from the king's meat for a while because you're not going to play the things of God and have the, the garbage of the world coming into you. It can't happen. You're not going to prophesy if you have no relationship with the Lord. You're not going to intercede if you don't know the Lord. If you're not totally sold out. You're not going to sing gospel on Sunday and go to clubs on Monday. You can't do it. You can't have the glory of the Lord. Saul proved that. Saul finally says, let's go up and worship your God, Samuel, because I don't have one but me. And our churches are full of me. We have gospel music awards that I call them GMA. It's like, give me more attention. <laughs> that looks really good, but could I have some more of me? We got gospel awards now. I'm going, award for what? If I get one, I'll be nice and say thank you. But I, it's just, it's, it's everything about us. We church shop. Because we want, can't find the place that works for us. We talked about this over Lori's house the other night. It's like, it's like Dollar Church. Well, you know, I'm thinking that they don't have a really good nursery at that church. And, you know, I want my kids to be involved. You know what your kids need, friend? Your kids need the Holy Ghost. Your kids need the Holy Ghost. Your kids need to be, instead of being babysat for two hours, what they need is what I saw in Mexico about a month ago. They need to be with all those little three, four, and five-year-olds that I saw laying before the stage in a fetal position, weeping and crying in the presence of the Lord. That's what your kids need. They don't, they don't need some hallelujah, how to duty telling them about the scripture all the time. That's good for a purpose, and it's good. I love VeggieTales. That's wonderful. But there needs to be some place that VeggieTales turns off, and your kids understand about the move of the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's only going to happen when you know about it. Because they'll do what Mama and Papa do. You need to have the Holy Ghost moving in your house. Your kids need to learn to... The, they need to receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues at their couch in their home because daddy and mama prayed them through to the Holy Ghost. Don't need to leave it to the people at church. That was my other pet peeve. I'll get off of that one. That gets a lot of people mad. But it's like, I don't like the music at that church. I like the music over at this church. I think the music director is so cute. He just dresses so good. And, and, and I love the way the choir robes look on everybody. And, and they always have the air conditioning on at that church. And it's just a comfort, you know. And, 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 and I know that my kids are being, it's just, you know, all the whole family gets ministered to. And, you know, I don't want to go over there to that revival church because they, you know, they, they, just the services are so long and and you know it's just you know my little six-year-old just can't sit down because you won't whoop his behind and make him sit down <laughs> I, I just I, you know I just you know we called them Pentecostal pallets when I was a boy you just brought the kids down and brought them a blanket and stuck them under the pew I mean it's just Am I saying child care is not important? No, we've got a minister here. Van Lane is one of the finest children's ministers, and I trust my kids to him. I think he'll teach them the ways of God. And one thing I love about Van Lane is Van lets the Holy Ghost move back there. 
And those kids sometimes get into intercession and prayer, and God starts moving back there before he ever gets out here. That's what I want my kids to be in the middle of. But what I'm trying to say is we've got dollar church going on. It's like, I don't like that church. Oh, it's just not comfortable. They talk too much about money at that church. I don't like going to that church. It's uncomfortable for me. Where are you finding that in the Scripture? Just, friend, tell me, where is it? Where is it that you find the comfortable place? You can't. What I find in the Scripture is that the more I love Jesus, the less I care about that stuff. The more I get in tune with Him and get in worship and intercession and hunger for the Lord, I get to the point where I don't even care if they preach. I don't care if they, I don't care if they have air conditioning on. If God's there, I want to go. I want to be where God's doing something. You understand? Now let's look at David who is Saul's replacement. And because of time, I'm going to paraphrase like a madman. When you look at David's failures in the 50, and his prayer of repentance in the 51st Psalm, the interesting thing that you'll notice some verbiage there that's so different than, they, than Saul's. See, Saul had to have his heart changed. David had a pure heart right out the chute. Do you hear me? His heart was for the Lord. The scripture says he was a man after God's heart. Do you know what that means? He was always aware of God's heart. He was always aware of God's feelings. He was always aware of what God thought about everything. And he started off opposite of Saul in every way. I love this. Look, Samuel gets recruited out of cobwebs to go anoint a new king because his first one he did was such a dismal failure he had to do it again. When you move over to the 16th chapter, look down to the 7th verses. God said to Samuel, he said, go and I want you to go to the house of Jesse and you're going to find the king. Have you ever thought about this? Think about this. Jesse had sons. How many sons did Jesse have? Seven, counting David? Okay. Jesse had seven sons. You know that back in those days when the prophet of the Lord was coming to your house, they had, you had to know he was coming. I mean, it would be like Oral Roberts coming to your house and just dropping in. I mean, you'd have to know that Oral was on his way. Now think about it. Jesse presents son number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven before the prophet of the Lord because he knows that the king of Israel is coming out of his house, out of his lineage. Isn't it suspicious to you that David is not even in the house? Isn't it suspicious to you, some of you who feel like the black sheep, your prime target for the Lord to use? Think about this. David, somebody said, well, my mama never did love me. My daddy never did love me. I was just always left alone. Some of you are fatherless. You go, my father wasn't. Well, you know, David may as well have been. I don't know about you, Mike, but I'm a proud papa, and I love both of my boys. And if I were going to present them before the prophet of the Lord, I'd make sure they were all there. Isn't it amazing to you? Have you ever thought about that? How Jesse didn't even have David on the premises? He had his other tall. Why? Because he saw David as the runt. He didn't see, his own father didn't see him as a king. He thought David was a little strange. David sings to sheep. David just, you know, he's a dreamer. He just sits out there all day. Me and his mother, we've really tried to make a man out of him, but he's a little, he's just not really a man's man. He's just kind of ruddy, and, and he likes stuff that boys don't like. He, you know, he, he likes to play his harp all the time and just sing and make up songs to, to God out there. And we all know that God only speaks through Samuel, so I don't know what he's doing. Does he think that God's actually listening? I mean, so when Samuel comes, you know, he's not even in the house. And it's the man of God who has to say, Jesse, do you have another kid? Because what I see ain't it. Do you notice that the people chose, and God chose the first king to be one that the people would accept. Where we are in the church right now is what people will accept, and it's palatable. But what God is about to do in the kingdom is not going to be palatable, and people are not going to suspect it, and they're going to think, you mean God is doing it there? You mean through him? Oh, can't be, because he's the musician over here that, that we hire and fire. He's the guy who's kind of goofy. 
He's the kind of guy who wears weird clothes. He's the guy who's dreaming all the time. He's always coming up with some goofy idea or another that can't ever happen. We all know that because we run our churches like corporations. And they don't let a corporation guy look like that. I mean, come on. But God is about to replace Saul. Does that mean with musicians? I don't think totally. But the pastor, I'm, I'm noticing an influx. I wrote this in my book. I am going to churches after churches after churches across the nation. I'm out two, three, I'm out a minimum of two weeks a month ministering somewhere. And it's astounding to me how many music guys turned pastor are pastoring churches. Does that mean all the pastors who aren't musical can't pastor churches? No, no, no. I'm just saying it's interesting just as a point of interest. And I'm also noticing that the pastors I'm going to now that aren't musicians will say, we are so hungry to see God come down and worship. Will you just go out there and worship? Do anything you want. We don't care. There's a new day coming and I can hear it. It's coming from the leadership of the church because Samuel has replaced Saul. He had, we don't yet know where David is yet. He's still out there in the field. But I believe that the prophet of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, has called forth into the house David. He said, David, come in. The Holy Ghost wants to see you. And out in the highways and byways and in the places we've forgotten are people that are broken, are people that are useless, are musicians that have had miserable failures in their life, pastors that have blown it. There are people out there in the edges of the, of the society that we've put away and we realize they don't have anything to say. But the Holy Ghost is saying, come forth. Come in out of the field. Because while you've been out in the field, I have put my heart in you. Not only have I changed your heart, I've given you a heart after my heart. And what God is about to do in the church is suddenly, instead of worrying about, you've seen a little bit of it here at Brownsville, our pastor's that kind of man that goes, you know what? I mean, who else would invite a bunch of preachers and musicians and get brooms out? Not someone worried too much about what people think. But there is about to come on the scene in the church of America and the nations a spirit of David that's going to rebuild the tabernacle in the last days. It's coming. It's coming fast. It's coming quickly. And we're going to see major differences. We're going to see David praying his prayer. Saul going, oh, let's look good in front of people. And we're going to see David going, baloney, I have sinned. Lord, don't leave me. Forget the people. Just don't leave me. Don't. I'll die if you leave me. See, what we've had in the, last, in the past is people worried about people leaving the church because they'll die if the people leave. But what we've got coming is leadership and people who are saying, God, if you leave, I'm in trouble. If the people come and go, that's fine. Let them go. But, Lord, i got to have you. I've got to have your presence. I've got to have your spirit. And if you want to come in on a Sunday morning and I don't even get to preach a sermon and we just all sit right here and go, okay, let's just wait on the Lord. In the pews, there's coming a change, too. Because if we, just, if we chose on a Sunday morning in any given church to just sit and wait on the Lord for two hours, we'd lose two-thirds of the congregation. They'd leave because they go, man, I'm not going just to sit there. They're supposed to do something. Who wrote that book? Who told you that? No, sir. The house of God is a house of prayer. The house of God is a house where we come into his presence and we wait on him and we serve him and we bless him and we pour oil and incense on him and we magnify him higher and higher and higher and we're all going for that time when we catch a glimpse of it. That's what the house of God is about. It's not a house of preaching. Do we need to preach? Absolutely. Do we need the word of God? We're in a mess if we don't. See, I, you can't have just prayer and no worship. And you can't have just worship and no prayer. They're Siamese twins. 
If you separate them, one will die. Why is your prayer life in crisis? Because you don't salt it and season it with worship. I can't go on. And another thing, your prayer life is full of praying for yourself. That's why your prayer life ain't going nowhere. Because intercession, last time I understood, was taking on somebody else's need and praying it. Prayer, last time I heard, was seeing the kingdom of God and what God was wanting to do and start praying the kingdom of God. That's what I thought prayer was. I thought healing and miracles came about when the anointing of all of the elders of the church laid hands on you. And the prayer of faith healed. But our prayers are not prayers of faith, they're prayers of self. Because Saul has been in charge. Now, I don't mean that I want to clarify my statements. I'm not saying that our pastors are all Saul's and they're all evil and they've lost the Lord. I'm not even talking about it. I'm talking about the church generally. Okay? Make sure you get that clear in your head before you go out of here and go, oh, you saying all the pastors are Saul's. No, I'm saying that the, this, this, this people-pleasing spirit that has moved into the church of the West is about to go out the door. And when I say go out the door, it'll probably still be around somewhere in some shape or form because people like religion and they'll go to a religious place. But where God is going to be moving is going to... The Lord showed me a vision in about 1997 in, this, in one of the meetings. And I, I shared it with some people. I haven't shared it with a lot of people. In my vision, I saw a room that was just bright white. And... I knew that there were jewels all in the floor. It was like a big vault. And it was kind of misty looking. There was, there was like an aura of glory in there. It was kind of, kind of an incense fog looking thing. But through the fog, I could see a host of angels standing around in this room. And it was like a big white vault. But through the fog that was on the ground and the mist that was everywhere, I could see sparkling jewels when the light would hit them, lay, just laid in the floor up against the corner. It's almost like you, you had a big bunch of jewels and you dumped them into the floor and somebody swept them into the corner so you could walk through the middle. Do you know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. And, and I thought, well, isn't it funny that they've just got jewels thrown over there and they're just not paying any attention to them? Then all of a sudden, the door opened at the end of the room, and this big angel, bigger than the others, walked in with both hands around a diamond that I had never, I mean, I assumed it was, it was massive. He had to have both hands. It was like, if, if I were the angel, he had to carry it like this. It was so big and perfectly cut, clear, like glass, just crystal clear, no fog, no color to it. And when it would, when the lights would hit it, it would almost, it's almost like blind everybody in the room when the light would hit it. And I noticed that the door he came in was a vault, an inner vault. And this was like an outer vault. And I thought, what is this, Lord? What is this? Why are you showing me this? And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, these are my pearls hidden in a field. These are my ministers that no one has ever seen. These are the ones that no one's ever heard from. These are the ones through whom which I'm going to do my mightiest work. The ones you see laying around the ground are the ones that people know and they're familiar with. They're too familiar. But what I'm about to bring out is going to be the pure gold the pure gem, I believe personally that it's David. I believe that it's been David who's been hidden away. See, it, we can't understand that in our society here, but when I go to nations like Mexico, they've never had a revival ever. We've had many here. England's had many. They've never had a revival. The pastor of the church told me from his own lips, he used this word, and I would normally never use it, but I'll use it today because he said it. He said, Lyndall, the Mexican race is a bastard race. And I said, that's kind of a strong word for you, a Mexican, to say to me. And he said, let me explain to you why. We exist because the Spanish conquistadors, the conquerors, came looking for gold. 
They came into our Indian villages and they raped and pillaged and looked for gold. They stayed long enough and impregnated the Indian women. And the Mexican race is a result of Spanish people interbred with Indians of South America. And he said, our fathers didn't come to build colonies. They came for gold. They came to take. And he said, we've never had a father. Now, that doesn't mean that all Mexican men are not good fathers. I'm just saying, well, this is what the pastor told me. And he said, we've been fasting, Lila, and praying and asking God to come to Mexico. We've asked God to come to Mexico and sweep this nation with a revival we've never had. We've asked the Father to come. You know what I believe the diamond in the vault was? I believe it's some people from Mexico, maybe, that we've never looked at the Mexican nation as a great nation and went, ooh, that's a desirable place to be. But I believe God is raising up men and women who have the heart of David. And they're more concerned with what God thinks. And they're more concerned with what God wants than they care about what people think. They don't care that their music is not perfect. They don't care that their image is not untarnished. They don't care that their buildings are perfect because it's just a place to meet in their eyes. What they're worried about is God moving, God coming to their nation, God coming to them. Do you hear me? America, do you hear me? I flew back into Houston after that, those meetings and I said, God, why would you even come to America? Why would you even come? Because we don't care. We've got a system that we're happy with. And here's what the Lord said to me. One more time. One more time. You better hear the word of the Lord this morning. The Holy Spirit brought you here to let you know that again, he's moving upon you to go after him. One more time. One more time. And if we reject the Lord as Israel had rejected the Lord as a nation, trust me, it won't stop the kingdom of God for an ounce. People think, well, we got to have America in order to have church, in order to have a revival. God doesn't need anything or anybody. God will choose Mongolia. God will choose the Sudan where all the persecution is happening and pour out his glory and turn the whole nation around. God can turn the hearts of kings in a moment. Who, do we, who are we to think that he's got to have us? We are full of pride and arrogance. But the Lord's saying, can I replace Saul in you with David? Can I take Saul's heart out of you? Can I take Saul's cares out of you? And can I put a heart of David in you? Many of you listening go, I don't want to be David. I don't want to be ruddy. And I, here's what I love. I, I wrote this down on my Bible. I, I underlined it because I thought it was so prophetic. The 16th chapter of First Samuel, the 7th verse. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. <laughs> In other words, who you're looking for this tall guy is not it because he looks like it. Because I reject him. I believe the Lord is saying to us now. Do I, now let me clear up a little bit here so you don't think I'm just off my rocker. Do I believe we should practice? Yes. Do I believe we should get an education? Yes, I want my boys to be educated. But I'll tell you this before the Lord with my hand up. If education is going to take my boys away from the presence of the Lord, I'd rather they not get past the third grade. Do I believe that you have to be, to be educated means that you have to lose the Lord? No. No, there are some fine men who have more titles at the end of their name than I can ever say that have a heart after God. No, sir, I don't believe that. But what I'm saying is Saul his days are numbered. And 
God is about to replace. And I think that's that void and vacuum we're in. Because you're here tonight, today. You came to conference here because you know what we are here. You know that we're radical after the Lord. And you know that we, we don't off, we're not here to offer explanation for what we do. But we're here to seek the heart of the Lord. You're dissettled in your heart. You're dissatisfied in your spirit. You're hungry for something you have not seen. You're desperate for something you don't even know how to get. You're desperate to see something happen that you don't even know what you're asking for. You just know you're asking. You don't even know what it is. You don't even know if you'll know what it looks like when you see it. But you're saying in your heart, Lord, this can't be all there is. What I'm doing in ministry can't be all there is. There's got to be more. Many of you have come in here and you're saying, Lord, my race has got to have a revival. My race has got to have revival. My city's got to have revival. My family, my nation has got to have revival. Something's got to happen. That's why you came here. You spent good money to get here. You spent time to get here. I want to challenge you. These few days, press into the Lord, please. You're going to hear some teaching. I've taught the most this morning that I will teach. I will not teach a solid hour and 15 minutes or however long I've gone. An hour and 45, I don't know how long I've gone. But I will not do this the rest of the conference. I will come back tomorrow with some things. But here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that maybe the last day we can ask some questions and do some question and answer, some questions you have. So let me invite you to take a pen and paper and write down any questions, any kind about music, intercession, worship, anything we can do to help you. And, and Lila and I and uh, several people will try to filter through the questions and answer them. We want you to go home with those answers as much as, uh, as we can give you, but I need you to write those down and turn them in before the end of the next session so we'll have them. But what I'm hoping is that we can get in this place this week and catch the heart of David and say, Lord, where I used to worry about people's thinking of me, I'm going to turn and start worrying about your thinking of me. Where I used to worry about, some of you are heavy this week, you've come in here, you're tired, you've ministered, you've poured yourself out, your little heart is broken. I mean, you have been through hell and, and nobody knows the hell you've been through. Nobody knows how desperate and how broken you are. If, if we were to rip open your heart and display it, we would be surprised at how hurt and empty you feel right now. But I'm telling you something. That's all about to change. Because that desperation that brought you here is going to bring you into what God is about to do. Do I think it's going to be great and powerful and millions of people are going to save? I don't know. Can I tell you? I don't care. I just want the Lord. I want him to be pleased. I want him to be worshiped. I want his glory to come. I want to see my God. I want another glimpse of him. I got to have, I'm a junkie. I'm messed up. I got to have more of him. Somebody said, well, you don't need more. You just need to do something with what you got. Well, maybe so. I'm doing what I got, but I want more. There's more I don't know of him. There's more in his scriptures. There's secrets hidden in there that I want to know. I want to know by the spirit because I'm in love with him. I care more about what he thinks about me than I care about what you think about my ministry. I spent years caring about what you thought. But I don't care anymore. I hope you, get, you receive something this week. But understand, I'm ministering to you. But I'm worshiping to him. I'm reaching down and saying, hey, here's what I've got. And if there's any of it you can use, take it. And if it offends you, then if, if I offended you in the flesh, I'm sorry. But if the Holy Spirit offended you with something I said, then just get rid of it and get right and move on. And you take whatever I got here. But I'm in, over here going, Lord, I, I want to tell you today that you're so good to me. 
And I want to tell you how much I love you. And I want to worship you and honor you. And I want you to know how I feel about you. I want you to know my passion for you. I want you to know, Lord, that if you take your presence from me, I am nothing but a dead piece of meat walking around with air and blood. I am nothing. Lord, if you take yourself away from me, if I ever do anything to offend you in such a way that your Holy Spirit would fly from me and not dwell with me, oh, Lord, if you don't like this piece of furniture, furniture in my house, I'll move it out. Lord, if if you don't like the way I worship, if it's too performancy, Lord, I'll, I'll walk up with no list and no song and I'll make up every one of them as long as you like the songs. I want you to like the songs. Lord, I'll sing hallelujah for two hours if that's what you want to hear. I want to do good songs and we'll rehearse, but Lord, that's just time to pass until you come. This is all just time to pass until you come. That's where my heart is. That's where your heart is. That's why you're here. So what do you say we just get rid of all the stuff this week and go bananas and see what we can get after God and most of all, see what we can give. I want you to reach down inside of you this week and pull up some worship that you've never even uttered. Somebody said, I can't do that. You can because the Lord puts it in you. Every believer, you've got, do you know you've got a spring of worship in you that hadn't even been tapped yet? And the reason it hadn't been tapped is because you're too worried about what people, you got Saul on you. You're too worried about, well, what if I step out? Boy, I just feel like doing this. <laughs> but Saul says you can't do that because people think you're weird. You go, you know, when I get to worship in the Lord, I just want just... But you won't do it because Saul's still on you. But there's a day when Saul's getting replaced. My God, I could preach. I'm closing with this. It's not just about bodily exercise or emotion. You understand that? I'm not trying to get an emotional thing out of you. Because emotion will get you nowhere. But sometimes you have to get your body and your physical man engaged because it's like, it's like opening a pinhole in a dam. You're all dammed up and you're all locked up and there's this well inside of you that wants to come out. And sometimes it takes something radical to shake and make a hole in that dam where the water can start to flow. And sometimes for some people it takes something real radical like this. Sometimes you say, I'm not a real dancer. I don't do it. Well, sometimes you need to cut a move. I mean, you just need to do it. Not because of any other reason. I have had more Baptists and Methodists come to this revival. They were the wild ones. And they, they, I've got the letters. I get the testimonies. Man, I'm telling you, you were singing enemy's camp. And I, you know, in my church, I'd have never done that. But you, you told me to get out and dance. And I got to dancing. And when I got to dancing, something came over me. And I just got, all this stuff started coming out. And I started getting free. And, and I started worshiping the Lord. And then found myself on the floor at the end of the meeting. And God started taking stuff out of me. I'm changed. My whole family's saved. We're on fire. Why? Because a pinhole got in the dam. And you started inside of you this week. There's stuff God wants to tap into. We got get a hole in the dam to start with and it may take this to do it so I want you to take the roof off take the lid off stand to your feet hallelujah I want you to have a good time this week okay will you do that father I thank you for your word and I thank you for this morning Lord in my heart I ask you Lord any vestiges of Saul that's still there, Lord, any pride or caring about what people think, any self-serving, any false religion, Lord, any, any disobedience that's in me right now, Lord Jesus, forgive me, Lord, and replace it. Replace it, Lord. Let me have a heart of passion for you and nothing else. Oh, God, I want to be like David, Lord. I'm tired. I want to be better than David, Lord. I want to worship crazier than David. I want to be a more lavish worshiper than he was, Lord. 
I, I can't even get to his level yet. Lord, just take us up higher, Lord. Take us to a place where our worship is, is spirit to spirit, Lord. Lord, I've danced, I've shouted, I've ran, I've rolled, I've, I've prayed, I've screamed, I've sang. And I know that, Lord, it's not bodily exercise and it's not emotion. Lord, I want to go to a place that's higher than emotion. I want to go to a place where my spirit is communicating with you. I want you to have my ear and I want to have your ear. And I want to say things to you that I can't even think of words, Lord. But I know inside of me. When you saved me, you put the words you wanted to hear. God, just give me some way to break those free and be able to say them like I never have, Lord. God, let my pen be able to write them of my heart for you. And Lord, unle un just loose me, Lord. Come on, pray that to the Lord. Say, loose me, Lord. Free me, Lord, to worship you like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Take about 15 minutes.